Good morning. I'd like to thank the Kershaw family for basically taking care of our entire worship service this morning, all the service you're rendering us. I'd like to thank the Spencer family for doubling our attendance by coming in this morning. And welcome to our service of worship. Um, please do sign the attendance pads in the pews. And then you can place those in the offering plate or I suppose leave them on the, the pews and we'll get them. But uh, this Tuesday we do have our committees and commissions meetings. So check with your leadership if you're on one of them to, to see whether you're live, in person, on Zoom, whether you're meeting for sure, all that sort of thing. Wednesday we have the Bible study and brew at uh, Terre Haute Brewing Company at 7.30 p.m. Thursday at 7 p.m. we have a high ground rehearsal. So guys, if you're in that group, don't forget. Uh, the Church Life Commission would like to remind the church that we're having a fifth Sunday potluck this month. So put that on your calendar. Be here if you can. The McKee scholarship application process is open. And if you can get to the church e-news, you'll find a link that takes you right to the application. Uh, for Operation Heart, the resettlement of Afghan refugees in Terre Haute, our current need is actually for people who can drive. We have English lessons, we have, um, we have doctor and dental appointments, we have grocery store trips, things like that, and we have 15 Afghans that we're currently servicing, and, and if you can, uh, we would love to have you join us in that. In fact, Judy Duffy has recently agreed to serve as a coordinator to schedule drivers. So that's a really great thing for us because it's, it's a pretty big need. So just thought I'd mention that. We do appreciate very much all the support this congregation has given to that effort. For our uh, <clears throat> prayer concerns this morning, let's pray for all families who are facing those difficult decisions with aging folks and the independence and safety and all the other issues that are a part of that web of things. So let's, let's keep those folks in our prayers and let us now worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us worship our Savior, Jesus Christ.
Please join me in the call to confession. If we claim to have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins before God. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from our neighbor's need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We have gone along with evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to face up to ourselves, so that as you move forward in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power over us. Christ prays for us. If anyone is in Christ, that one becomes a new person altogether. Past has finished and gone. All has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. down, kiddos. Hello, my friends. All right. Good morning, good morning. It's fun to see so many. Well, friends, today we're here to talk about peace. Can you tell me anything about peace? Anything? If I say the word peace, what do you think? Hmm. What did we just do? Did anybody say peace. peace be with you? Like that? Peace be with you? Why do we do that? Because we want others to feel our love, maybe. Okay, well, I've got a book, and it is called, What Does Peace Feel Like? Hmm, does it feel like a handshake? I don't know. Let's see what this book has to say. So this is called, What Does Peace Feel Like? Right. 
How interesting. The word peace is beautiful in all languages. Did you ever close your eyes and try to imagine peace? So there's a lot of words for peace. Pause. That dog said bow wow. And that means peace. Shalom, salam, pace, pause, and other ones I don't know how to say, right? What does peace smell like? So this book interviews kids. So some of the kids said, like a bouquet of flowers in a happy family living room, like fresh and new furniture, Uh uh-huh, like fresh air that makes you want to go out and sleep in the sun, like pizza coming out of the oven. Does that smell like peace? I don't know. That just smells like a hungry tummy. I brought something that kind of, I think, smells like peace. Let me see. This is lavender. You can pass this around. Here's a little bit. You can smell it. To me, that smells like summer and peace. Okay. You can pass it. All right. You want to hold it? What does peace look like? These kids said, like a cat and a dog curled up together in a basket, napping. Like new babies, just born yesterday. Like a cloud high up in the sky that just happens to be there, giving happiness to everybody. White and fluffy peace. Did you hear the clouds last night? That didn't sound like peace. That was a little intense, but we needed rain. What about like your mom that kisses you and hugs you? And peace looks like something beautiful that goes away, but we'll come back. Can you think of anything else? What does peace look like? Does this room look like peace to you? What about your bed? Is that cozy peace? What about movie night on the couch? No? Yeah? Maybe some peaceful snuggles. Okay, what does peace sound like? Any ideas before I say what these kids said? No? Okay. Like a growling bear of war who gets shot by a love arrow and the fighting stops. Like a silent day, like laughter and happiness on a birthday, like raindrops falling, like everyone's heart beating, making one big sound together, like voices singing, like when our choir's here. That sounds like peace to me. And like no bad words. Sometimes what peace sounds like is maybe just your voice, the way you say something. Sometimes I told my students, Okay, think about how you just said that. Can you change your voice and try again instead of, give me my pencil, you just knocked it on the floor. Can we say that in a more peaceful way? Ooh, help me out. There's my pencil. Yeah. Okay, what does peace taste like? Mm. Any ideas? Food. What's that? Any favorite peaceful tastes? Cheesecake? Mm. (laughs) So vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, strawberry ice cream, banana ice cream. I think these kids like ice cream. Um, Sweet, definitely not sour. Like your favorite food times two. Now I did bring some mint. You can try a leaf of mint. I did wash it if you want to chew on some mint. I think that tastes kind of fun. I don't know about peace, but it's yummy. Oh, cool. And it's at some camp. Yeah? That's great. Okay, what does peace feel like? Anybody? Do you have any animals that feel peaceful? Guinea pigs. pigs. Bunnies. Mm -hmm. Pigs. Pigs. Yeah. So, like hugs your friends give you when you cry, like the fur of my cat Alice, the fur of a baby mouse. 
I don't want that piece in my house. Um, like somebody stroking your back, and I brought another plant that to me feels like peace. This is lamb's ear. Yeah, that's lamb's ear. You can pass it around. You can have it if you want it. So it can also maybe feel like your soft blanket at home. If you ever need a little hug from home, you just grab your blanket, right? Just imagine what we could build with peace. Can't draw it here. A book is too small for that. But look who built this church a long, long time ago. Do you think they built it with peaceful intentions? For sure. A place of quiet reflection. <laughs> there is something in this room flying around that is not peaceful. But, <laughs> but this place was built with peace in mind. And we are here to be reflections of that peace. All right. You don't like bugs? Oh, bummer. I feel you, buddy. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us to find the peace in everything that we do, in what we hear, what we taste, what we feel, what we smell. Please help us to be stewards of your peace and to take it with us everywhere we go. All this name we pray. Amen. God, teach us by your word, we humbly pray, that we might come to a deeper understanding of your ways. Help us to conform our heads and hearts to your desires. Lead us in those paths which you have ordained. Use your church to make peace, lift up truth, and spread love in your world. In your holy name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy, and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small, and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who lives in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt?
Thank you, Steve. For our New Testament lesson today, we go to the book of Colossians, one of those letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches. We're going to be in chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. Listen now for the word of God. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in, in heaven and on earth were created, Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Scout's honor, this is true. In the writing software that I use, when I start to type in my last name, I get to R-I-G 
and it fills it in automatically with righteousness. <laughs> I would love it if that were true, but I know better. I have too close an affinity for John Calvin. I, I, I call myself a recovering Calvinist sometimes, uh, and I, I attended Al Holder's John Calvin Sunday School class in which he reminded us of Calvin's view of human nature. A hint, it was not rosy. Um, I have too much water under the bridge, too long a track record to ever think I could qualify as righteous. But while I may not be holy, I do at least have this much going for me. At least I know that I'm a sinner. But is such self-focus really all that useful spiritually? The Christian writers I tend to read tend to be gadflies. I appreciate people who can think for themselves and offer critiques of groupthink. I read everything I can get my hands on by the likes of Simone Weil and Leonard Sweet. But what are their likes? Who are they? Simone Weil was a French Jew who converted to Christianity during World War II and wrote powerful essays combining existentialism and spirituality. Leonard Sweet is a southern fried critic of the church from a faith perspective. What could these people possibly have in common? They and their ilk do not follow the herd. They have an honest, accurate assessment of other people's points of view and thorough critiques of them, and they seek to follow God's call wherever it may lead. I wish I had one-tenth of their integrity. I wish we all did. For over 30 years now, Leonard Sweet and a group of like-minded writers have warned of a specific modern heresy, the deification of ourselves. We have made gods of ourselves. In his book, Red Sky, Sweet argues, quote, we have twisted the very real, necessary conversation about our identities, sexual, gender, personal, into a manifesto claiming that whoever and whatever I believe myself to be must control my life and yours too. End quote. In short, he says, we have made ourselves false gods. Now, Leonard Sweet is a progressive Christian. He offers piercing, if somewhat gentle, critiques of, of Christians who condemn other people on uh, you know, superficial uh, cases. But at the same time, he has no use for this self-absorption that's such a big part of our lives these days on social media and everywhere else. And he has even less use for those churches who pander to people. He's my kind of guy. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul addressed a very different form of heresy, but his prescription for fighting that one applies perfectly to our self-deification. It's what we need to do too, and it's to remember this. Jesus is God. Not me. Jesus. Completely. From before time began, he accepted a thorough demotion to become a human being just like us. He died, as all of us shall. And yet, his death made life possible. Though we, through our self-focus and the whole panoply of our sins, have estranged ourselves from God, Paul tells us, Jesus has restored that relationship. His death on the cross has paid the bill we owe for our sins, though we remain disobedient to God, Christ has redeemed us. Some years before writing this letter, we know as Colossians, Paul had walked into Colossae, an insignificant little town in western Turkey. Colossae no longer exists. The site, its site is well known, but it's so unimportant that no archaeologist has bothered to dig it up. To this day, no road more than one lane wide leads to the place. Paul apparently wandered into the town on his second great missionary journey. He could not have planned to go there. There was no reason to go there. He happened upon it on his way to someplace else. 
But then we often find important things on our way to someplace else. The word heresy, it's a big word. It's a big, it's a big accusation to make. Heresy means dangerously inaccurate teaching about God and God's intent. One of the great heresies of our day is worshiping the United States of America instead of God. Another heresy of, heresy of our day is unreflectively hating the United States of America. The specific heresy Paul encountered in Colossae predated Jesus' birth into this world. For years, a worldview had crept across the face of Asia Minor and Southeastern Europe. Its roots lay in Greek philosophy, though none of the great classical Greek teachers, Socrates, Aristotle, would have recognized it. This view posited the existence of great numbers of unseen spiritual beings that mediated between heaven and earth. Because the gods in this worldview were indifferent to humanity, detached, completely at remove from this sphere. So there needed to be some kind of mediation and these intermediate beings were neither gods nor humans, they were untainted by human imperfection. The Greek word used to describe human nature in this way of thinking is translated as dirty. And so this was the way that the gods could communicate with earth without dirtying themselves. When the Apostle Paul came to Colossae and started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, many of the people in that little town would have assumed that Jesus was one of those mediators. That was the heresy. Paul could have nothing to do with this view. For him, and hopefully for us, Jesus was and is nothing less than God. All right, God born as one of us. Okay, God who consented to die. Yet God who controlled the entire process from beginning to end. The one God who ordained the whole timeline. Paul's words matter to us today because of our self-focused heresy. We want to star in our own show. Paul shines the spotlight solely and squarely on Jesus Christ. He is the image of God, Paul says. Now, in the original Greek, that doesn't mean that Jesus somehow looks the same as God. No, in the thinking is that by being in the image of his Jesus' actions, his attitudes, his whole, his whole being are the same as, identical to God. The book of Genesis tells us that we too are created in the image of God. Same image. Though we, of course, distort it with our sins. Paul continues on to claim that, quote, all things have been created through him and for him. This is a roundabout way of saying that he is the creator. He and God are one. He existed before any other part of creation. In fact, there's never been a time when he did not exist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Kind of seems like a, almost sort of a trivial claim to make after all these big sweeping statements about Jesus being God. And yeah, oh yeah, by the way, he's the head of the body, the church. But this just reflects the importance in Paul's way of thinking of the church. Think about it. It's not for nothing that very early on, one of the most common metaphors or images or symbols for the church was a sailing ship. Because it was a place of safety, a way to navigate through rough and rocky waters. Paul sees Jesus as the captain, if you will, of that ship. A place where Christians, who wherever they lived in the earliest of days, they would have been a tiny minority in the midst of people who were often hostile to this new religion. They needed the safety, the spiritual safety, of Jesus being their head in the body of the church. Next, we read that, that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. This is a reference to the resurrection. And this, too, was a shot across the bow of an early heresy, another, a different one. From the very start, during the days depicted in the book of Acts, there were some Christians who denied that Jesus had died. 
Jesus is God, right? God can't die, right? He must have only appeared to have died. Maybe he hid away, maybe in heaven, some speculated, during those three days before he reappeared. To all of which, Paul straightforwardly claimed Jesus became the firstborn from the dead. He died. And then he came back to life. And by the way, the phrase firstborn from the dead implies there will be other resurrections as well. If he's just the first, there will be others who follow, others like us. For Jesus has made peace with all creation through the blood of his cross. In our branch of the Christian tree, we tend to focus on ministries of inclusion and social justice. And there's nothing wrong with those things. We need to do them. But every now and then, we need to remind ourselves that we worship the God who died, that we might live. The 20th century theologian Arnold Harnack, Arnold Harnack called this the kernel of Christianity, the heart of the matter. We worship the God who died and came back to life. Now, Harnack was a classical liberal thinker whose writings focused mostly on applying biblical insights to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s and 70s in various parts of the world. Yet he saw Christ's death on the cross and the resurrection as the heart of Christianity, the most important point of all. He also called Christ's death and resurrection God's reversal. God's reversal. Now in wrestling, a reversal happens when control of the match switches from one athlete to the other. A theological reversal, God's reversal, happens when life wrests control of us from death. God's reversal. And this is what Jesus accomplished with his death and his resurrection. I have a favorite contemporary Christian band, although they're getting kind of long in the tooth like me nowadays, but they're called Burlap to Cashmere, and I've learned that virtually nobody has ever heard of them. Burlap to Cashmere. They use world music genres to reach younger generations with the gospel. Their song, Diggity Dime, is probably one of my favorite songs of any type that I've ever heard. It's set to Greek folk music being played by synthesizers and electric guitars. You, 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 that's the best I can do. You have to go look it up on YouTube and listen to it. Diggity Dime. In their song, Chop Chop, set to Los Angeles Techno Chicano music. I know I'd never heard of that either, and I had to go look it up. Los Angeles Techno Chicano music. They sing Chop Chop Man Fell. That's where we're from. And the world is crying as we move along. Chop Chop He Fell. That's where we belong. And the world is wondering how it happened. Chop, chop, he rose. That's where he went. And the world cannot see him in all his glory. Or as Paul put it in Colossians, you who are once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death. Again, his body died. Paul admits no possibility of Jesus' death being faked. And this matters for us today, again, because we do need to remind ourselves from time to time that we worship the one God who, out of love for unlovable us, died in agony on the cross. In truth, unless Jesus really died, what are we doing here? I can think of all kinds of other uses for my Sunday mornings. Bet you can too. But as Paul wrote, I have this pesky thing called faith that is securely established and steadfast. I did not achieve this faith. 
It does not reflect well on me that I have it. It comes as a gift from God, the Holy Spirit of that same one God. Many of us have wondered why we do church. Well, Jesus is the head of the church, and in him we have forgiveness and reconciliation. This frees us from the dread that comes with no faith. Moreover, it gives us the energy to answer whatever callings he has given us. This empowers me to answer all the emails, make all the phone calls, write all the sermons, serve our Afghan friends, and all the rest of my calling. I answer the calling with God's power, not my own. May each one of us, rooted and grounded in faith in both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, do the same. And let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we ask that your spirit would move us. We thank you for the gift of faith and ask that you would help us to receive it and to nurture it. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal to us where you want us to go, each of us individually and this congregation as a whole. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your love for the Father and obedience to the will of the Father that led you to the cross. And we thank you for the power that you displayed when you walked out of the tomb. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated and refer to your bulletins that we might participate together in our unison response, our affirmation of faith from the Theological Declaration of Barman. In Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus Christ is God with humanity. He is the eternal Son of the Father who became human and lived among us and fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. 
This work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls women and men to be reconciled to God and to one another. Would you please join me in our prayers of intercession? Oh Lord, our God, at every stage of our lives, we need your help, your guidance, your direction, and we pray it for one another, especially in this prayer in which we intercede for the needs of others. Lord, we pray for children, for babies and children, that they might be safe in their homes, that they might be eager to learn and to grow. Lord, we pray for young people, that they might make wise decisions, and that they might continue to grow and, and to mature, that they might take the right paths in life that you have ordained. We pray for young adults, Lord, as they're figuring it out, trying to establish themselves independently, perhaps. We ask that they, too, might be kept safe in their worlds, and that they might find those who love them as they wish to be loved. We pray for those who are in the middle and who are wondering how much longer it's going to be, whether they'll ever grow up, those kinds of things. Pray that they might be steadfast in their faith and not grow weary. We pray for those who are entering, entering the ending years and we ask that you would keep them safe as well and give them hope and a faith that what comes next will be glorious. Lord Jesus, we pray for all people in positions of leadership and power, that they might have wisdom, that they might turn to you for guidance. We pray, Lord, for preachers in all the churches. We pray for staff people who are seeking your will and how to implement it in program and in class. We pray for those who support the work with the, even the most of humble of, of occupations. Lord, we thank you for the churches and their work. Lord, we pray for this town, for all its people, rich and poor, Christian and non-Christian, black, white, brown. We ask, Lord, that there might be less poverty, more wealth, but wealth spiritually as well and that people would find what they need to live their lives in every way. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for each other's faith that we might really truly believe that you died, that you rose, that you reign, that you pray, all of it, Lord. We thank you for the support of the body of Christ, the church of which you are the head, and we give back to you now those words which you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy will be done thy will, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, accept these our offerings, we ask, and every offering that we're empowered to make through your spirit. Use them, we pray, to further your workings, your intent, your will, near and far, now and forevermore, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.